welcome into lecture number 14 of linear algebra. This lecture is on inner product spaces. So let's start by defining an inner product. Basically, an inner product is a generalization of a scalar product on Rn. So let's write out the definition uh, precisely here. Um, but an inner product on a vector space, so this is what we're defining, inner product on a vector space V is a function and we're going to denote this function by angle brackets. So it's going to take two arguments. So I'm going to draw it like this. And then we'll, you'll see in a moment exactly what this means. But it's a, it's a function that takes in two vectors in the vector space and returns an element of the field, which we're, we've been studying real vector spaces this semester. So it's going to return a real number. And it's going to obey three rules. So... Um, this can be written in more than three rules sometimes, but we're going to write these in three different rules. But the first rule is that x times x, so that's a product, so we'll say x times x here, is non-negative. So it's greater than or equal to zero for all x in V. All right. And it's only equal to zero, all right, uh, if and only if, x itself is the zero vector in your vector space. So in general, only the zero vector uh, squared is equal to zero. So you can say squared here. This is x times x it, but by the inner product. Only x times x equal to zero. Uh, the only way that can happen is if x is the zero vector itself. And x times x for any other vector x is going to be positive. Okay, It's going to return a positive number. The next criteria then is that x times y is going to be the same as y times x. All right, and this is again true for all x and y in our vector space v. So that's called symmetry. Um, this is, by the way, there's a couple things, a couple names here. I'll write them all down in a moment. But um, item one is uh, positive definite and non-degenerate. And then step uh, item number two here is symmetric. And item number three is going to be linear. I mean, everything in this course that we study turns out to be linear in some way or another. And here's what linear is going to mean for an inner product. But if we have alpha times x plus beta times y uh, in the sense of the vector space, right, and then inner product with z, this is the same as alpha times inner product of x with z plus beta times inner product of y with z. And this is linearity. So it says that the inner product can be broken up over plus signs, right? Addition. This is vector addition in your vector space. And by scalar multiplication, the scalars can factor out, right? The scalar multiplication factors out. So this is true for all x, y, and z in our vector space v and all alpha and beta in our field. And remember, our field is the real numbers here. All right. So like I said, um, uh, we can encapsulate all of this into one phrase. So we can say then that an inner product on V is a symmetric non-degenerate positive definite And then we're going to call it a bilinear form because actually the linearity, because of property two, the linearity is true in both of the entries, right? Um, positive definite bilinear function, but then in this case we're going to call this function a form on V. So you can just replace this word form with function. But again, um, what's what here? Let's just match these up. Symmetric, that's property two, right? Uh, non degenerate and positive definite both come from the two different parts so non-degenerate is actually this part and positive definite is this part of number one and then of course the linear or in this case bilinear comes from item number three all right so that's the definition of an inner product basically it's a function that takes in two vectors returns a number and it's going to um, obey these three or maybe four if you think of this as a separate one three to four properties all right so let's look at some examples now in this lecture i am not going to go through the proofs of verifying all three of these properties for every one of these examples that we write down um, that's going to be an implicit exercise although i am making it explicit by saying it out loud right now right um, so let's just write these down as examples 
And what I'd like you guys to do is at some point, either right now, pause the video and verify that the, these three axioms hold for each of these functions that I'm about to write down, or um, write these down in your notes and then make sure that you check them later. But you should definitely verify that these axioms, these three to four axioms of the, of the inner product are obeyed by these examples. So our first example is the scalar product of Rn is in fact an inner product, all right? So the scalar product x transpose y on Rn, uh, it obeys all of these properties, right? So this is an inner product. And remember, this was called our scalar product on Rn. So in some sense, the scalar product is like the uh, fundamental uh, inner product that we can model all, in, all other inner products on, right? Or by, but this is the scalar product on Rn. So that turns out that that's an inner product, x transpose y, that, that vector multiplication on Rn. Okay, so there's an, that's one. Here's another example. Um, on the vector space, so I'll, I'll define the vector space here, V, to be the continuous functions defined on an interval, interval A, B. All right, the inner, there are lots of, again, inner products here, but one inner product on this space, and maybe the standard one we could say, is that the inner product of F times G is going to be equal to the integral from A to B, that's the interval of definition, of the product of these functions. So F of X times G of X dx. So again, uh, we've already went through the details of verifying number one is an inner product. Uh, you should just check and make sure that you understand this new notation. Um, but we, we, in the scalar product lecture, we went, we went through the details of, of those properties of the scalar product. Um, it is an inner product. This is brand new though, right? So now you should, again, either take a moment now or take a moment later to verify that this integral uh, satisfies all of these properties. So for the first property, what you'll do is you'll plug in F to both entries, right? F inner product with itself, and then try to justify that that's, that integral is going to be uh, non-negative. You can very easily show that it's symmetric and then very easily show that it's linear, okay? Because it's an integral, right? Okay, so there's there's one, and that's this one we're going to call our standard inner product on the set of continuous functions or the vector space of continuous functions. It's going to be the standard one, but we can modify it in many different ways, and, and, and we will, right? And especially in applications, you guys will when you use linear algebra later on in your lives. Um, but let's say, let's let W be a positive function, strictly positive. It doesn't have to be constant, but a positive function on this interval from A to B, the same interval, um, then it turns out that we can define an inner product using this function, right? So then we can define our inner product to be, let's say, f times g subscript w, and then this one's going to be the in, defined by the integral from a to b of w of x times f of x times g of x dx. So this w function, the reason it's called w is because this is a weight. It's a weight function. So w equals w of x is called a weight function, all right? Or a weighting, weighting function. We'll just call it a weight function for our purposes. And then this is a, obviously a weighted inner product. Now, um, again, what makes it weighted as opposed to this one is just that this one we defined first. It's kind of in some ways more fundamental because it's just defined by an integral. And then when you throw this extra function in there, it, you in your mind, you think that you've changed this one. But again, uh, as long as this function w is positive, then this inner product by itself, this function by itself, will satisfy all of the axioms of the inner product, and therefore is in its own right just as good of an inner product as, as uh, the previous one in item two here, right? Um, so the only one that makes, the only thing that makes this one kind of more fundamental, quote unquote, is that it's defined by the integral, which we're very familiar with from our calculus classes, right? Okay, um, here's another example, uh, which again, you should verify, but let's this time say that our vector space is going to be p sub n, so this is polynomials of degree n minus 1 or less, right, at most n minus 1, and for this one to define the inner product, I'm going to first define a set of points. So let's let, I'm going to write it as a set, so x1, let's name this set though. Let's name this set X, capital X. So this will be X1, X2, 
through xn. Let this be a set of distinct points. So in, in other words, there's no copies, no repeats. Distinct points in R, so real numbers. Then the following is going to define an inner product on the set Pn, right? So then bracket P with Q, so P times Q. We can define this to be P applied to x1 times Q applied to x1 plus P applied to x2 times Q applied to x2, etc. And so these points, uh, maybe we should put an x down here, right? So this, the, these points define an inner product in this way. So it goes all the way up through P sub n times Q, P of x sub n times Q of x sub n. Okay, and so another way to write this is, of course, P, Q um, equals sub x equals the sum, i goes from 1 to n, P of x sub i times Q of x sub i. So again, verify that this is going to define an inner product uh, on the set of on the vector space, I should say, of polynomials of degree at most n minus 1, right? Polynomials degree less than n. Okay, so those are all examples. Um, we'll see those as we move forward in this course. But let's now look at a couple of properties. One is going to be a property itself, and then we'll write down a theorem. But remember that we talked about uh, this in a, in a previous lecture about scalar products that one of the benefits of having a scalar product or now an inner product is that now we can start to study the geometry of a vector space. And what do we need to be able to study the geometry of a vector space? Well, we need to be able to measure lengths and angles, right? So lengths are measured by the following. So if we have a vector v in our vector in a just an abstract vector space with an inner product, right? So let's say we have a v in our vector space with inner product. So by the way, an inner product space, which is the title of this lecture, right, uh, is a vector space together with an inner product. So we might write it like this in parentheses, V with its angle bracket here, right? Um, this is an inner product space. We call this an inner product space. So that tells us that we have a vector space with an inner product. So whenever you say inner product space, you automatically know that it's a vector space. Okay? It's automatically a vector space. Okay, so we've got our vector v and it's in the inner product space. Then the length of v with respect to this, right? With respect to this inner product. But the length of v, sometimes called the norm of v. So again, sometimes this is called the norm of v. Uh, in this space, I'm going to write all the details here, but in this space, V with the inner product, so in the inner product space, is given by exactly what you probably think it is. So we use the same symbol here, length of V is the square root of V times V, inner product with itself. Okay, so that's exactly what the length should be, right? So there's the, that's the length, or you could call it the norm of the vector V in this inner product space. All right, um, there's a couple other definitions. We, you could work these out um, and kind of derive them, but I want to just give them to us now. So uh, we get a distance function that kind of the same way that we did with a scalar product, right? So the distance function or the distance between two vectors now, uh, let's call them u and v, both of these in our inner product space. Right, is given by the same thing that it was in the scalar product sense. So the distance between u and v is going to be the length of the difference vector u minus v. All right, and that's of course symmetric. It, it does everything um, that you would expect a distance function. It has all the properties that you would expect a distance function to have. And then uh, we can measure the angle between two vectors as well. Okay, so this is again done exactly as it was done. Uh, with the scalar product, except now our vectors and our scalar product are replaced by abstract vectors um, and an inner product, right? So the angle between these same two vectors, u and v, so we'll say u and v, again, both in our inner product space. I really want to emphasize the inner product has to be here to measure an angle, right? Uh, 
So this is given by, so it's I, maybe I should say defined by, right? But theta is equal to the arctangent of uh, the inner product of u with v divided by the length of u determined by that same inner product. So th from this formula, right? The length of u times the length of v in the denominator. So there's the angle between two vectors. And this is in an abstract vector space. So you ha it has to be an abstract vector space together with this inner product, right? Um, but w once we know that, then this is exactly the formula for the angle that we used, that we learned for a scalar product. It's exactly the same formula. All right? Um, this leads us to a definition, and then we'll write a theorem here. But definition. Remember, we said that two vectors are orthogonal if their scalar product is zero. Now we're going to extend that to inner product. So it's going to be the same story, right? So uh, two vectors, uh, u and v in our inner product space. Again, we, we got to make sure we're in an inner product space. So our inner product space, we'll write the same way here. So v comma the inner product. These two vectors are orthogonal. That's the word we're defining, but it's the same definition that we had before. So if and only if u inner product with v is equal to zero. Okay, so again, this can happen two ways. One way is if, well now it's kind of like the defining property and actually uh, we should define it this way and then, you know, derive the angle formula a different way um, that's okay though. So if we go with this though, then the two possibilities are that one of these angle, one of these vectors is the zero vector. So remember two possibilities for being orthogonal. So either you have um, one of u or v is equal to the zero vector, or the angle between u and v with respect to this inner product, right, is going to be pi over two. So these are going to these are going to be orthogonal, as in the sense of perpendicular. Um, if you're talking about arrows or line segments, right? But now we're in, in abstract vector spaces. We have an inner product, which plays the role of the scalar product, and then we can think of our abstract vectors as having the same kind of geometric properties that our arrow vectors had with the scalar product, right? Our arrows or our line segment vectors. All right, like I said, uh, I want to finish this item here off with a theorem. And so this is called the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem is exactly, or it's, it's called the Pythagorean law here, but it's exactly what you would expect, right? So it says the following. If um, u and v are orthogonal, so automatically to use this word we have to be in an inner product space, but if they are orthogonal, then the following is true. The length of their sum, so u plus v, squared, so the length squared, is equal to the length of u squared plus the length of v squared. Okay? So, uh, this is exactly the Pythagorean theorem, though. a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is the sum, right? c is the sum of the two. It's, it's the third side, right, of that triangle. So, let's work this out and actually prove it. It's very easy to prove. This is a one-way theorem the way I've written it, so it's very easy to prove. So first of all, we get to suppose, right, that u is orthogonal to v. Remember, this is a symbol. It's perpendicular symbol is the one that we use for orthogonal. So if we suppose that u is orthogonal to v, then that means um, that inner product of u with v must be zero. That's our definition, right? On the other hand, we can write out the length, the definition of the length of u plus v, and then we can use the linearity properties of our inner product. So let's write it this way. Meanwhile, the sum u plus v quantity squared, this is the same as u plus v inner product with u plus v. All right, by property number three, of the inner product, each of these are linear, so we'll do it in two steps, but by property number three directly, this is the same as u times u plus v plus v times u plus v. All right, so that's just using property three of our definition up here. That was called bilinearity. 
then um, we can use our symmetry and then bilinearity again, or we can just use linearity in the, in the other slot, right? So we don't need to use, we don't need to stick to only these three, but obviously because of property two, this linearity property also applies in the second component. And so we can, we can break that one up as well. So when we do so, this will just become u times u plus u times v plus v times u plus v times v. All right, and then by property two, so those are both by property three, but by property two, these two are equal to each other, right? u times v is the same as v times u. That's the symmetry property of the inner product. And so we can then write this as u times u plus two times u times v plus v times v. Well, our assumptions tell us that u times v is zero, right? So that one's zero. And then uh, just our notation for sure, our, our notation for length, right, tells us that u times u is the same as the length of u squared and v times v is the same as the length of v squared. And so at this point, we just basically gather everything back together and we are done. So this is the length of u squared plus zero plus the length of v squared. And so that's because we got to assume that our vectors were orthogonal, right? All right, so there's the Pythagorean law or the Pythagorean theorem for inner product spaces. It's not just a theorem about triangles in, you know, on the plane that you learned in grade school or high school. It's actually can be extended to this theorem um, for inner product spaces, okay? Um, theorem for inner product spaces. All right, so the next thing we'd like to do is define a norm. So we already talked about the word norm. I, I mentioned it, I should say. We didn't talk too much about it, but I'm going to define now a general definition here of the term norm. And in doing so, we're going to define a normed linear space. So this is akin to an inner product space except it's going to be a, a vector space with a different kind of function defined on it. But a norm linear space is a vector space V, that's the linearity, so vector spaces are always linear, but it's, it's a vector space V together with a function, and this time the function is going to take in one vector and return one number. So it's together with a function satisfying the following. Um, first of all, I'll write it over here, but our, this time we're going to use the symbol, the double bar symbol, and it's going to take in a vector and return a real number. All right, so the double bar symbol, that's our symbol for the norm, and the properties that the norm has to satisfy are that the norm of any vector has to be non-negative, all right, and so that's for all v, and if the norm of v is equal to zero, then this implies, that's a zero number, this implies then that v is equal to the zero vector. All right, so the first part of this is true for all v in our vector space v. And the second part is just an implication, right? So again, that's the non-degenerate part. The second part is non-degeneracy. The first part is positive definite. So those two words are the same, all right? The next two properties are going to be the replacements for linearity. And we don't, we, there's no symmetry because there's only one entry here, right? So, um, but it's positive, definite, uh, non-degenerate, okay? And then here's the next two properties. So the next property says that the norm of alpha times v, where alpha is any scalar, this has got to be equal to the absolute value of alpha of the scalar times the norm of v. So the, abs the scalar multiplication kind of factors out, but when it does so, you have to make the, the scalar become positive, right? And that's because um, if, it, if a negative comes out, that would mean that the norm of alpha v itself was negative, and that's not allowed, right? So this part's got to be true for all scalars alpha, all real numbers, right? And all vectors v in our vector space. All right? So... That's kind of, it's not, that's not linearity, right? It's, it's kind of like a pseudo linear. It's not quite linearity there. All right. And then the third property is not linearity either. Okay. This is going to be called the triangle inequality. And it says the following, that the norm of V plus W should always be not equal to, but less than or equal to 
the sum of the norm of V plus the norm of W. Okay, so this has got to be, again, true for all V and W in our vector space, and this is called the triangle inequality. All right, this is called the triangle inequality, this last property here. So these are the three axioms of a normed linear space, and really of, these are the axioms of the norm itself. So these, these three properties make this function uh, a norm. They're, they're the defining properties that make the function a norm. Um, what I will say here is that every inner product defines a norm. So every inner product defines a norm. And we, we even called, we used that word norm up here, right? Norm squared. We didn't use it for this example maybe, but we talked about the norm as another word for the length back here, right? The norm. Um, so every inner product does define a norm. So that's one important fact, right? Every inner product defines a norm. That means then that uh, every inner product space is also a norm linear space, right? So if we have an inner product space, so we have our inner product space V with the inner product, right? So this defines a normed linear space that overlays the same vector space. So this defines a normed linear space defined by V with the norm, right, where the norm comes from this inner product. So the norm is exactly the one that we talked about before, right? So the norm of V is going to be the square root of the inner product of V with itself. Okay? So it turns out that the converse of this statement, though, is not true. So again, every inner product defines a norm by this following formula. But not every norm comes from an inner product, all right? So, but not every norm corresponds to or comes from, you know, by this formula right here, corresponds to an inner product space. So this means that actually um, a norm is weaker, right? More space, there are more normed linear spaces than there are inner product spaces. It's a weaker constraint, right? It's a weaker weaker restriction. If you just talk about the norm and you don't need the inner product for anything, um, then you, there are more possibilities of spaces. However, you lose information though, right? Because the inner product is required. So the norm can define a distance. We know how that was defined. If we go back up here, we, you get your length or your norm and you get your distance um, from the norm linear space. But what you don't get are the angles, right, and the idea of, or the notion of orthogonality. So those, those are, for those two geometric properties, those require an inner product and not just a norm, okay? So to illustrate this, let's look at a couple examples, and then um, we'll leave this lecture here, because this is just a, we just want to define these, these, new, these new objects of study. Um, but we have a little bit more to do. So we want to illustrate that, that not every, um, norm comes from an inner product. So for this, and we'll, to do this, we'll define some norm. We'll, we'll give an example of some norms. So these will be called the P norms on Rn. All right, so the P norms on Rn. So here's the deal. Let's let P be a real number greater than or equal to 1. All right, P is a real number greater than or equal to 1 then the following formula defines a norm. And again, this is going to be an uh, implicit exercise, made explicit as I say it out loud, but implicit exercise to verify that the axioms are met or, or satisfied by this formula. But this is going to be x sub p is going to be equal to the sum, i goes from 1 to n, of the absolute value of x sub i to the power p, and then that whole sum raised to the 1 over p power. Okay, so um, this defines, this, this formula right here defines a norm on Rn, all right, and it's called the P norm. It's called the P norm. And again, no, this P can be any real number uh, greater than or equal to 1. 
I actually it could be smaller than one. It could be a half. You can change, you know, but, but for the sake of this definition, let's just say that it's greater than or equal to one, but you can replace it with any positive number actually. Okay, so let's take a couple looks, uh, look at a couple of these. First of all, the two norm. So the two norm, if we write this out, let's say, let's look at the two norm on R3. So let's look at these on R3, just for the sake of writing out enough terms that we know what's going on. Um, let's just see how this works. So the two norm then is going to be uh, given by the following formula. I'll write it out and then we'll try to write it in a different way. But it's going to be the sum from 1 to 3 of x sub i squared, right, p is 2, and then to the 1 half power. So what does this mean? Well, this is going to be uh, big parentheses here of x1 quantity squared. Notice you don't need these absolute values when you have an integer that's even, right? Absolute value of x2 squared plus absolute value of x3 squared, and then the whole thing, 1 half power. So that is then the square root of the sum of the squares, right? So this is the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries of the vector x on R3. Again, R3 is just for example here, right? You can make this any Rn. You can have any n here um, and define this two norm on Rn for any n. But notice then, this is the one, right? This is exactly the one. Uh, that's the length, right? This is the usual length. So this is the usual length. This is the usual length in R3, and it comes from the scalar product, right? Or I'll say coinciding with the length from the scalar product. So the two norm is the one that comes from the inner product, or in this case, the scalar product. Um, it's the two norm is the one, right? So this means, so therefore, the two norm is equal to just the usual norm that we studied from the scalar product from up above, right? Or we could say from Euclidean geometry, the geometry that we studied uh, in, in school, right? So the two norm is the one that gives us that geometry. All right, but we can replace the two with any positive number. So let's, let's replace it with a one, right? Um, so... Again, let's write meanwhile again. Meanwhile, the one norm of this vector in R3, this time it's going to be what? It's going to be the sum. I goes from 1 to 3. Absolute value x of i to the 1 power, all raised to the 1 over 1 power. And so this is just the sum of the absolute values of the entries. x1 absolute value plus x2 absolute value plus x3 absolute value. So this one, it turns out, does not come from an inner product. So this one cannot be recognized as the norm associated to an inner product. It's just a norm, but it is a norm. So it's just a norm by itself. This is called the one norm. So that's the one norm. All right. Now you can do this for any real number, but we can also define, we can also define something called an infinity norm. And the infinity norm uh, is just going to be the limit of all these, right? So the infinity norm on Rn, right, this is given by, so a couple of things, so on one hand, x infinity, this is going to be equal to the limit as p approaches infinity of the p norm, that might be a little hard to wrap our brain around, it turns out that there's just a really nice formula for this, uh, and this is going to be the one that we want to compute with, but the infinity norm of x is going to be the max, uh, in this case it's 3, right? But I'm going to put n here. So this is, I, I defined it on our n. So we'll go back up to r3 in a moment, but it's the max of the absolute values of the entries. So the maximum absolute value entry, that is the infinity norm um, on our n. So that right there is the infinity norm. It turns out that it's the limit of all the p norms as p approaches infinity, uh, but this formula is nice and easy to use, right? Very nice and easy to use. All right, so let's finish uh, off this lecture by just looking at an example with some actual 
numbers again in, in R3 just as just to see how these three norms vary or differ differ from each other. So let's consider a vector x to be vector 4, negative 5, 3. Obviously that's an R3. And I want us to compute the two norm, the one norm, the two norm, and the infinity norm, the three that we just wrote down. Remember the two norm is the one that comes from the length of the vector, right? But the other two are not, they're different. So the two, one norm, the two norm, and the infinity norm of this vector. All right, so let's see how it works. Um, you can pause the video now and work this out on your own if you want and then just catch up with me, um, or I'm just gonna go for it here. So you can, uh, you can just follow along if you want. But the one norm, according to our definition, the one norm is the sum, i goes from one to three in this case, because we're in R3, of the absolute values, right? So this one's gonna be the absolute value of four plus the absolute value of minus five plus the absolute value of three. So that's four plus five plus three. That's gonna be uh, 12, right? Nine plus three is 12. So the one norm of this vector is 12. The length of this vector in terms of the one norm, right? The one norm is in terms of the p norm where p is equal to one is 12. Let's do the two norm. The two norm is the usual Euclidean length, right? So this one's gonna be um, the square root, I'll write the formula, the square root of the sum, i goes from one to three, absolute value, not necessary, but we'll write it, x sub i, quantity squared, square root that whole sum, right? So this one's gonna be the sum of four squared plus negative five squared plus three squared. And so this one's the square root of 16 plus 25 plus nine. And so this is the square root of 50, right? Which is uh, 25 times two. So that's gonna be five square roots of two, right? So that's five square roots of two. That's the, and by the way, two is about a little bit bigger than one, a little bit less than one and a half, right? It's 1.45 something, right? Um, so square root of two is a little bit less than one and a half. So this is um, around seven and a half, but it's not, you know, it's a little less than seven and a half. So it's much smaller than 12 actually, right? Okay, and so then let's check the infinity norm to end this little brief study here, but the infinity norm is, as we know, the maximum entry. So the maximum of the absolute value of the entries from one to three. Again, because we're in R3, there's three entries. So this is then gonna be the maximum of our entries absolute value. So four, absolute value of negative five, it's five of course, and three. And of course the maximum of all these is five, right? It's just five. So these norms all give different lengths for this vector, all give different norms of the vector, um, but they do all satisfy, and again, hopefully you check that, make sure you take a moment to check that, that all three of these satisfy the three axioms of a norm, and therefore they make our three normed linear spaces um, with, e with e any one of these norms, right, one at a time, but any one of these norms. Um, but the geometry that you get from these are, are slightly different. Okay, so I'm going to leave this lecture here and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.